Welcome back to Anatomy Physiology, Chapter 12, Part 2. We're going to spend a little time talking about the things that link the neurons in the brain. We're going to talk about neuroglia. And I'm starting off with Einstein, first of all, because, you know, he's kind of like my hero. And um, I, he had so many good sayings. Here's one of my favorites. Everybody is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. And I have seen so many kids who are so gifted in so many ways, but because they can't do calculus or they can't memorize something, they think that they're stupid. So I really like that saying. Um, another one is... This seems to be an odd thing since I'm telling you guys, memorize facts, memorize facts, because that's what anatomy is. You're memorizing facts. And then you use all of the things that you've memorized to figure out how the body works. That's the physiology part. So anatomy is mostly just the memorization so that you can look and see how they work. But Einstein says education is not learning just facts. But you train your mind to think about the, the facts that you've learned. So anyway, I think that's kind of cool. So when he died, or when he was dying, they asked him, they said, will you donate your brain to science? And he said, sure. And so he donated his brain to science. And when he passed, they gave pieces of his brain to various laboratories that he had promised pieces of his brain to. And they expected to find a whole lot more neurons, a whole much uh, more nerve cells in his brain than in anyone else's. And they were really surprised to find that he didn't have any more nerve cells in his brain, neurons, than anyone else. Where he had a surprising thing was the neuroglia, the support cells. He had more of those. So you can't grow new neurons. We're going to learn about that. Your nerve cells are pretty much set. Now, they're finding that there is a possibility that we may be able to grow a few more nerve cells. And so I'm watching the research on that with great interest because that will be awesome for people with Alzheimer's, people who've had strokes, uh, all of these things. That would be great if we could grow new, new nerve cells. But as it stands right now, pretty much uh, the ones you have are the ones you're going to keep. But the neuroglia, the support cells, we can uh, grow new ones of those. So this next section, we're going to learn six types of neuroglia, the support cells that help out the neurons. We're going to look at the myelin sheath. And the myelin sheath is a little bit different out in the peripheral nervous system than it is up in the brain. And we're going to find that some of your nerve fibers are unmyelinated. They don't have an insulating cover on them. And then some nerve fibers can regenerate, so we're going to learn about that. Here's a partial list of some of the things that you do with your neuroglia. You kind of hold the neurons together, and in the fetus, they help the neurons go where they need to go, covering the mature neurons, so that would be that myelin sheath that we're talking about. It's important to keep neurons from actually touching each other. So here we're, we're holding them nearby, holding the neurons together, but don't let them touch because they're electrically charged, and if they touch each other, then they'll short out. Um, the other thing that they don't mention on here is they, they help with um, immunity, keeping things from attacking the brain cells, and nourishing them, taking care of them that way. Of the six types of neuroglia, four of them we're going to find in the brain and the spinal cord. So oligodendrocytes, Ependymal cells, microglia, and astrocytes are the four different ones that we're going to be talking about. Now, the oligodendrocytes are kind of neat because they reach out and wrap their cell membrane around the neurons nearby. 
Here's a picture that shows you the four different kinds of neuroglia that you find in the uh, central nervous system. And here would be just a neuron. So there's your neuron, there's your dendrites, and here's your axon right here. Here's the axon coming down. And as you're coming down here, you're seeing the oligodendrocyte. So here's its cell body right there, and there's its nucleus. And it literally takes its cell membrane, stretches it out, and wraps it around the axon of a neuron. But look, it's doing it over here also. So it's wrapping it around here. Now you can do this in the brain because the neurons are close together. So you can find, here is one oligodendrocyte right here. It is laying down a myelin sheath. It is taking its cell membrane and wrapping it around the axon. And it's doing it here and it's doing it there. So they can reach out and wrap around nearby neurons and insulate them by using their cell membrane. So there you have that one. All right, so there's your neuron. The astrocyte has the ability to connect like this. So here's this is the cell body. of the neuron. Here are little microglial cells. These, notice, are not attached. They look like little snowflakes floating around, but what they actually are are modified white blood cells. So these guys are looking for anything that got into the central nervous system that shouldn't be in there. Viruses, bacteria, protozoans, fungus, anything that shouldn't be in there, and heaven forbid, cancer cells. So they're looking for something to destroy. So that's your microglial cells. And then your ependymal cells are secreting the cerebral spinal fluid, or CSF for short. Another thing the ependymal cells do, since they are lined with cilia, not only do they secrete the cerebrospinal fluid, but they are also circulating. So they're just kind of waving the cilia and keeping it circulating around. And these line your internal cavities of the brain. So when people tell you you have holes in your brain, you really do. When we get to the chapters on blood and immunity, one of the things we're going to talk about are the five different kinds of white blood cells. And one of them is called a monocyte. And when there's nothing going on and you, it's not fighting anything, it's rather small. It's, it's maybe uh, half again to twice as big as a red blood cell, but it's just kind of hanging out. But if it is challenged, if, it is, if there's something in there that is um, not supposed to be there, then it, I always say it's like the Hulk, and it gets a lot bigger and it becomes more active, and we don't call it a monocyte anymore, we call it a macrophage. So microglia are monocytes that are actually now large enough to be macrophages, and they're protecting your, your brain and your spinal cord. By far the most abundant glial cells that you find in the central nervous system are the astrocytes. So they're covering the surface of the brain, uh, places where you don't have synapses. They help make the creative, uh, or excuse me, create the supportive framework. They form your blood-brain barrier. You've probably heard of the blood-brain barrier that keeps things out of the brain. They can regulate your blood flow. They have enzymes to convert glucose to needed nutrients. They secrete nerve growth factors, and this is going to be important, nerve growth factors, because if something damages a neuron, then the astrocyte can stimulate it to grow new axons, new dendrites. They can communicate electrically with neurons. They regulate the chemical composition of tissue fluid, 
And if a neuron is damaged and they, they can't get it to, to repair itself with nerve growth factor, then they can form a hardened scar tissue, which we call a sclerosis. Now, when we talk about uh, blood vessels, you've probably heard of people who have hardening of the arteries. They have sclerosis, sclerosis, hardening. They actually deposit calcium on the lining of the arteries. So they're not able to push as much fluid through. Here's another artist representation of the different neuroglia that they have in the central nervous system. This does a better job of showing you the astrocyte. Look how it's connecting. So there's the cell body of a neuron. And here's a blood vessel. Remember it said it made the uh, blood-brain barrier. So there are some things you don't want coming out of this blood vessel and getting into the brain. So by covering it like this, you can limit access to the brain and what comes out of the blood vessels and enters the brain. Here's another picture of the ependymal cells. And they're basically cuboidal cells. There's cuboidals, cuboidals, but it has the cilia. So they're, remember, they're moving the cerebrospinal fluid around for you. Um, here's, again, oligodendrocytes. And they can reach out. They're only showing you a few of them, but depending on which book you look at, it says that you can have one oligodendrocyte that may cover up to 200 places on the uh, neuron. The other two types of neuroglia are found out in the peripheral nervous system, and those are Schwann cells and satellite cells. So uh, we learn ever so much about Schwann cells. We spend a lot of time talking about them. And we really don't talk that much about the satellite cells. I'm going back to this picture that we were looking at before because it shows you the Schwann cells and how they wrap themselves like a pancake around the axon. So when the nerve impulse comes out of the cell body, and goes down the axon, instead of having to depolarize all the way, it jumps from here to here to here to here. So it goes very much faster than it would if it had to travel the whole distance. Now, the reason that we have the Schwann cells out in the peripheral nervous system, and we have the oligodendrocytes in the brain, is because in the brain the neurons are close to each other. So it's easy for one cell to reach out and wrap around several different neurons in several different places. But out in the peripheral nervous system you may not have a neuron near another one. So that's why these Schwann cells are individual cells and they're not servicing any other nearby neurons. Now keep in mind that a nerve is actually just a bundle of axons. And what we normally call nerve cells are now called neurons. So keep those in your mind. So what is the longest axon in the human body? Well, it's the sciatic nerve because it comes all the way from your spinal cord all the way to the big toe of each foot. Now that's pretty amazing when you think about it because nerves, neurons, are you can't see them without a microscope. And yet this thing has a process sticking off of it that is, depending on how tall the person is, could be over three feet long. So that's, that's pretty impressive. Now the reason I bring this up is because you, if you damage the nerve cell body, if you damage the neuron cell body, which is known as the soma, you're not going to be able to regenerate that nerve. But if you sever the axon, if you sever the nerve, the, the process sticking off of the neuron, you can regrow it. It takes a little while. 
And what helps the axon to grow and to know how to grow are these Schwann cells. So because they're wrapped around, they kind of give the axon a place to shoot, to, to reach, to grow to. So this is kind of similar when we talk about the skin and we talk about the connective tissue that underlies the skin. If you don't put the edges of the connective tissue together, then the skin doesn't know where to grow and the connective tissue doesn't know where to grow. And so you end up making scar tissue. So in the case of the uh, neuron and the nerve or the axons that come off of it, if you cut those, the myelin sheath of the Schwann cell will help assist in regenerating damaged fibers. It sh basically, it shows them where to grow. Now those satellite cells, when we talk about ganglia, and we're going to spend some time talking about ganglia, but you have places where you have wads of the neuron cell bodies, the nerve cell bodies, and you can't have nerves touch each other because they'll short each other out. They have an electrical charge across them, so you have to keep them isolated. And so these satellite cells are providing electrical insulation especially for the neurons of the peripheral nervous system, which reside inside of ganglia. I'm going to show you this slide again because you will see this on a test, guaranteed. The myelin sheath around axons is formed by oligodendrocytes in the brain and spinal cord, the central nervous system, and by the Schwann cells in the peripheral nervous system. So just go ahead and stop right now, make a note to yourself, okay, she's going to ask us that. And there's a surprising number of nerve jokes. Here's one of them I thought was funny. You know what gets on my nerves? Myelin. We talk about afferent and efferent nerve cells or neurons. Here's just a couple of interesting things about myelination. So obviously you start it before you're born, along about three and a half months. Here's what is kind of a surprise. You don't actually finish myelinating your um, axons until you're in late adolescence. So you're uh, through puberty even. And because myelin is phospholipid bilayer, you've got to have fat. So eating fat is important to the development of your central nervous system, your brain and your spinal cord, the myelination of your peripheral nervous system. So all of this hoopla about fat is horrible and cholesterol is horrible is just wrong. You've got to have it. But where we are, in America especially, we are eating way too much, way more than we need just to make uh, our cell membranes and to myelinate our nerves. So f too much of anything is not good, but you do need fats. So don't try to cut fats out of your diet. As long as you know that the Schwann cell wraps around the axon in the peripheral nervous system, I'm happy. They're going through and naming some bits and pieces, but um, I'll not be uh, requiring you to know that. If you cut through the Schwann cell so you can look inside, there's the axon and there's the layers where it's wrapped around. And then, of course, you have to have the nucleus of the Schwann cell. Here are a couple of words that you do need to learn. That gap between the different Schwann cells or the gaps between the oligodendrocytes are known as nodes of Ranvier. Nodes of Ranvier. So they're the gaps between the segment. That's where the actual depolarization event occurs. And we haven't really spent a lot of time talking about depolarization, but we're going to get into it. So you start out, you're leaving the soma, you're leaving the cell body, and there is a, they call it the axon hillock. And then you get to the first glial cell. 
and then you go on. So that is the trigger zone. So going back to our pretty blue cell right there, here you are, there, there you're leaving the cell body, you're leaving the neuron cell body, the soma, and there's the axon hillock, and now you're getting down to the first of the Schwann cells. So here's where your depolarization will start, and then go jump, jump, and this is your node of Ranvier. There's a node of Ranvier. Node, node. That's known as saltatory conduction. So I always thought that was rather an odd term. Like salt and pepper, it's saltatory conduction. If you remembered earlier, we talked about sclerosis. It is a hardened place where you replace the axon with scar tissue. If you have multiple sclerosis, or MS for short, then the oligodendrocytes and the myelin sheath in the central nervous system deteriorate. And the myelin is replaced by hardened scar tissue. And so if this happens, now nerve conduction is disrupted. So before you were able to just go bouncing from node of Ranvier to node of Ranvier, but now you have uh, some of those um, oligodendrocyte where they're, it's wrapped around is now replaced with scar tissue. So you're going to have a, a slower time getting the signal through and a harder time getting it through. So this can result in double vision, in tremors, in numbness in various places of your body, your speech defects. So usually if you're going to get it, you get it between the ages of 20 and 40. And you'll usually live from 25 to 30 years after they've diagnosed you. So obviously this is something we need to look into and see if we can't uh, help people who have MS. They think that it's triggered by a virus. So there's a few things that we talk about as we go through this course that are triggered by viruses. And one of them is um, type 1 diabetes. They think that there is a flu virus, and when you're getting over the flu, you attack the um, cells in the pancreas that make insulin. And there's other autoimmune things that we do when you're getting over a strep throat. Sometimes when you think that you're attacking the bacteria that cause strep in your throat, you actually go and you destroy parts of your heart, and they call that rheumatic fever. So they think that there is a virus, and I've not heard the name, if they think it's a flu virus or which virus it is, that they think can trigger uh, multiple sclerosis or MS. I remember that after the flu of 1918, there were so many cases of Parkinson's in the people who survived it that they suspected that perhaps the flu of 1918 triggered an autoimmune uh, cause of Parkinson's disease. Sometimes cartoons are not funny, but they help you remember something. So here you have the myelin sheath, and here you are destroying the myelin sheath. So you're exposing the axon, and you're replacing it with scar tissue. It says, this will cause multiple sclerosis. Here's another nerve illness that attacks the myelin sheath. And this one is within the Jewish people, not because of anything that the Jewish people have done wrong or anything bad about Jewish people, but Jewish people tend to want to marry other Jewish people because they share the same religious beliefs. And any time you have a group of closely related people intermarrying, then any of the uh, recessive genes or, or genes that cause conditions can be more easily passed along. So this is why Tay-Sachs is mostly found in Jewish people. Basically, your, your, your brain gets this fat in it, 
and within a few years. This says usually fatal before age four, but I've heard that it's usually fatal before age two. So if you get one gene from your mother and one gene from your father, and you are homozygous for the Tay-Sachs, then you're going to build up gangliozide, which will disrupt the conduction of your nerve signals. So you're going to be blind, you're going to not be coordinated, and then, of course, you're not going to be able to process your thoughts, so you will have dementia. A horrible way for it to watch your baby die. If you find all of this interesting, I recommend that you watch a movie called Lorenzo's Oil. It is, it is a true story, and it's just some parents who gave birth to a child who had this condition, and they found, by doing research, that if they gave their child this certain oil, it would compete with another oil that was causing the child's brain to be destroyed. So, in the movie, they found a cure, um, but it was too late for their child. So, a little spoiler alert there, but it is a really amazing. So, of course, people are like, you're not doctors, you can't be treating your own child, you know. But they said, well, our child's going to die for sure. And so, anyway, it's excellent. I highly recommend it. I started out this talk talking about Einstein, who is considered to be the smartest man on earth. And then here's people saying that Stephen Hawking is one of the smartest men that ever lived on earth. He had an interesting take. He had ALS. Um, ALS is short for amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. And it, the muscles are not being stimulated by the nerves. So if they're not being stimulated by the nerves, they're not going to fire, they're not going to contract correctly, and they're actually going to shrivel up. ALS is also known as Lou Gehrig's disease, I think probably because most people can't say amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. And it destroys the motor neurons. So afferent is where you get the information. Those will be your sensory neurons. Those aren't damaged. It's the motor ones, it's the efferent ones that cause the muscles to contract that are damaged. So ALS doesn't affect the person's sensory functions. Everyone loved Lou Gehrig, and so like I said, they named it after him because he died of it. Now, interestingly enough, you usually die rather quickly with ALS. But in the case of Stephen Hawking, he lived 55 years with it. So he is definitely a medical miracle. But what's interesting is he said, I wouldn't wish this on anyone, but if I hadn't been frozen in my own body, if I hadn't been forced to just sit and think in my own mind, I never would have come up with all of the physics that I learned, and I wouldn't have become the world's greatest physicist. So he, he obviously didn't have any problem with uh, modesty. <laughs> I was stationed outside of Cambridge, uh, outside of London and Cambridge, at a time where he was actually there at the University of Cambridge. And I never got to go see him. So I was always sad. That was one of the things. I didn't go see the Queen either. But I sure hung out in London a bunch. And there are two things that influence how fast a nerve impulse is conducted. One of them is, how big is the axon? How, what is its diameter? And that kind of makes a little bit of sense to you. Think about how much water you can get out of your garden hose, and now think how much the firemen can get out of their hoses, which are much larger. So you get more, you get it faster, 
and you get more if you have a larger axon. The other thing, of course, is whether or not you have myelin on the axon so that you can do that saltatory conduction jumping from node of Ranvier to node of Ranvier. I don't expect you to memorize the speed of transmission for muscle fibers or nerve fibers, but it is interesting that the speed of the really large myelinated fibers could be up to 120 meters per second. So converting 120 meters to feet, that'd be about 390 feet. So really, really fast. When a neuron is damaged, if the soma, if the cell body is still okay, then you can regrow the axon. So downstream, distal to the injury, you're going to dissolve the axon and macrophages will take away the, the broken down axon components. And then you're going to start growing a new axon from the stump. This can take months to occur. So a lot of times if there's been damage, they say, well, let's, let's do physical therapy, let's watch, let's do, let's keep our fingers crossed, let's hope. But after about six months, if you haven't regained uh, feeling or you haven't gotten the nerves to where they're working again, then probably the cell body was damaged and you're unable to grow a uh, new axon and reconnect. And now we're getting to the electrophysiology of neurons. So this is really important. And a lot of what we talk about, the electrophysiology of neurons, is also true for the cell membrane of a muscle cell. So we're going to learn about the electrical charge across the membrane, the voltage across the membrane. We're going to talk about depolarization and repolarization and how a nerve signal goes down the axon. It was a little over a hundred years ago that they discovered synapses. So there was a lot of things that had to go on before then. We had to have uh, staining methods that were developed, things like that. So we haven't known about electrophysiology all that long. It seems like they're always talking about men who've discovered amazing things, but here's an amazing woman who got the Nobel Prize for discovering the function of nerve growth factor. So it does pretty much what it says. It is It causes the nerve to extend the axon. It's a chemical that she isolated. I enjoyed this cartoon. So here are kids and it says, look, there's mom's last nerve. I want to touch it. And there's mom right there. Don't be touching it. Don't get on my last nerve. So let's take just a second and review what you know about electricity. Most of you guys have played with 9-volt batteries. You paid, played with AAA batteries, AA batteries. If you look on the side of those AA and AAA batteries and C and D batteries, it says 1.5 volts. So you have one and a half volts in each one of those batteries. So if you use two batteries, that would be three volts. If you use four batteries, that would be six volts. You know that batteries can go dead. You can use the energy up that's in the battery. And now you don't get any charge. You don't get one and a half volts. You get maybe 1.2 volts or even less. And now your toy won't work, your phone won't work, whatever it is that you have. Now, if it is a rechargeable battery, then you can plug it in and you can cause it to recharge. Well, luckily, your nerves and your muscles are rechargeable. But now, remember, these things muscles and nerves need to be 
seen with a microscope. So they're very, 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 very tiny. So the electrical charge across the membrane of a nerve or a muscle is way less than 1.5 volts. In fact, it's about 70 millivolts. So to give you an idea of what a millivolt is, take one volt and divide it into a thousand little pieces. A millivolt would be one one thousandth of a volt. So you'd have to have a thousand of those millivolts to make just one volt. volt. So in the case of a neuron, it's about 70 millivolts. And the reason they put the negative, it depends on where you put the electrode. So I don't know if you've ever used a battery charge, uh, um, not a battery charger. I was trying to say battery tester. So here are some of the battery testers. This is the one I usually use right there. It's got two little needle tips. And then you just turn the gauge on, put this up against your battery, and it'll tell you how much voltage you still have left in your battery. So when they were putting these little probes right there across the membrane, they put one on the inside and one on the outside. And because of the way they did it, they said, well, the voltage across the membrane is negative 70 millivolts. In a battery, you have one end is the negative pole and the other end is the positive pole. Well, in your cell membrane, in your phospholipid bilayer, you have the inside of the membrane more negative than the outside of the membrane. And we do this with sodium and potassium. Some batteries, like the battery in your car, is, has acid in it. So if you try to charge it incorrectly, it can actually blow battery acid on you. And nowadays, we have alkaline batteries, we have lithium batteries. These are things that can keep an unequal charge so that when you turn something on, like your car or your cell phone or whatever it is you're turning on, you're going to get a flow of current from a higher level to a lower level. So this particular slide is talking about charged particles flowing down an electrical gradient. Now again, in your body, you're not using acid and you're not using alkaline and you're not using lithium, you're using sodium and potassium. Here is a, an artist's representation of a cell membrane. There's your phospholipid bilayer. And you've got these little channels that allow the sodium and potassium to go through, but only if they're chemically or electrically uh, stimulated to do so. So you're going to have an overall net charge of sodium outside and an overall bunch of potassium inside. But because there's more sodium outside than there is potassium inside, the inside just under the, the cell membrane is going to be more negative in there. So if somebody was busy looking at this and then they wrote na 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 Batman. I thought that was kind of funny. So if you can remember Batman outside the cell membrane, and potassium, which is K, on the inside, then you're going to be able to remember a lot more of the electrophysiology that you need to know. This is known as the resting membrane potential, and they're telling you right here the resting membrane potential is about minus 70 millivolts. So here it is telling you in words that outside the cell you're going to have more of the sodium and inside the cell you're going to have more of the potassium and they can't get across the membrane unless you open up those gates and let them through. So as long as the gates are closed you're going to have a potential. You're, basically your battery's charged. The cell membrane is charged and you've got minus 70 
millivolts available. That's your electrical charge that's available. So on the batteries that you use, it's one and a half volts, or if it's a nine volt battery, it's nine volts. But in your cell, in each one of your cells, it's about negative 70 millivolts. So to get across the membrane, you're going to have to go through an ion channel because the ions are charged and they can't just move through the phospholipid bilayer. So there are specific channels that only allow potassium through. There are some that only let sodium through. But the one that we really care about and the one we're going to talk about is the sodium-potassium pump which moves them much more quickly than they can trickle through these ion channels. About 70% of the energy that the nervous system uses is simply recharging the cell membrane. After you have used the cell membrane, you've had a nerve impulse go down, or if it's a muscle cell, you've had a muscle contract, then you've got to recharge, and you need ATP energy to do that. So what you're going to do is you're going to have a sodium and potassium pump. If you're sitting there and you're not firing your nerve or you're not firing your muscle, then you're going to have just a little bit of the potassium that will trickle out because it's much more concentrated inside than it is outside. So you have a diffusion gradient through the potassium channel, and some of the sodium will be uh, diffusing into the cell because there's a lot more sodium outside than there is inside. But overall, the inside is negative and the outside is positive at resting membrane potential. So how can I get a nerve to fire? How can I get a muscle to fire? Well, you can use chemicals. We have neurotransmitters. We have hormones. Light works on some of your sensory neurons. So obviously in your eyes, they're stimulated by light. You have other neurons that are stimulated by heat. Others by mechanical disturbance, like you touch someone or you apply pressure so when we learned about the skin, we learned about the Meissner's corpuscle, and we learned about the Pacinian corpuscle, and those are some of the ones that detect mechanical dis disturbance or touching. If you do this, if you stimulate the cell membrane by any of these methods, then you're going to change the membrane potential because you may open up sodium channels and now sodium rushes in and the potassium rushes out and now instead of having minus 70 as your potential across the membrane basically it it goes flat it, it discharges so we call it depolarization and you're approaching zero I'm a dog person and I have several dogs. I call them puppies because they're little bitty, but they're actually adult dogs. But they're always falling asleep in my lap. And one of the things that I enjoy doing is I run my finger across their fur to see how long I can rub my finger across their fur before they notice it and they wake up. So the stimulus is me running my fingers through their hair and you have graded stimulation. So just lightly, lightly touching it, they don't feel it. I didn't reach threshold. But as I go and brush them just a little more firmly and wiggle a few more hairs, then all of a sudden they notice it, and then they think that I'm a fly or a bug crawling around on them, and they start kicking or doing something funny, which is why I do it. So you, you can have graded stimulation. So you can get a little, little bit of depolarization, but not enough to cause the axon to fire or not enough to get the muscle to contract. Here's the artist's picture showing you a chemical 
that is going to stimulate the axon to depolarize. And here it is binding to this, this gated, voltage gated, or chemical gated, in this case, ligand gated um, channel. So here it is binding, and when it binds, it causes this to open. When it opens, then the sodium can flow in more rapidly. So basically, you are discharging the cell membrane, just like you use your iPad or iPhone or Android or whatever you happen to have. You use it, you use it, you use the electricity, and then it goes dead. So this, you can allow the sodium in, the sodium in, and the sodium in, and now you don't have a, poten a, a electric potential across the membrane anymore. So basically, it's, it's dead. And it's just going to sit there, and no amount of stimulation is cause, will cause this nerve to fire again. You're going to have to get that sodium back out, recharge, and make a, an imbalance across the membrane. And once you've done that, once you have repolarized it, then you can fire your nerve again. Or if this was a muscle, then you could have your muscle contract again. So you can do this with a chemical. You can do this with electricity because you also have voltage gated. This just happens to be a ligand gated. So a chemical attaches and opens it up. If you open up enough of these gates, if you have enough stimulation, whether it's by electricity or whether it's by a chemical or heat or light, if you reach high enough concentration or opening of these voltage-gated channels, then you're going to cause an action potential. So you're going to get a wave of depolarization that's going to run down the axon. So I've been saying that the muscle fires or that the nerve fires, but the technical word that I should be saying is the neuron produces an action potential. But I think that you can see it a little bit better if I say that the nerve fired. Some nerves are very sensitive, and you don't have to have as much sodium to cause them to have an action potential, and others are less sensitive, so you're going to have to open up a lot more of these voltage-gated or ligand-gated sodium channels in order to trigger that action potential. So the threshold varies for various different nerves, and we're going to find in another chapter that there are some of the neurotransmitters the chemicals that cause this to happen, that cause uh, the threshold to be lowered. So they're very excitable. And then we find things like GABA, G-A-B-A, and that one is going to make it where it's very hard to get that nerve to depolarize. So it's one of your inhibitory neurotransmitters. So we'll talk about those too. But basically, if you can reach the threshold, then you're going to generate an action potential, and you're going to have the sodium and potassium changing sides all the way down the length of the axon. Three words you definitely need to know, because you will see them again, hint, hint are depolarization, repolarization, and hyperpolarization. So depolarization we talked about is when the sodium-potassium channels open up and the sodium rushes in and the potassium rushes out. So that's depolarization. So before you depolarized it, you had a charge across the membrane. Once you have finished depolarizing it, it is no longer polarized. There is not very much, if any, charge remaining across the membrane. So in order to get it to work again, for the nerve to fire again, for the muscle to contract again, you're going to have to repolarize it. So you have to use that sodium-potassium pump, and you're going to use ATP energy, and you're going to pump that sodium back out of the cell, 
and you're going to pump that potassium back into the cell. And so now you have an unequal charge across the phospholipid bilayer, across the cell membrane. And so now you're ready to do it again. But sometimes you overshoot it. So you're repolarizing, you're repolarizing, you're recharging it, and you can actually hyperpolarize. So you can, you can cause it to be even more uh, negative or more positive than it was before. Now, you don't do that with your batteries. If it's a 1.5 volt battery, you're going to charge it till it gets to 1.5 and then you pretty much stop. But because your membrane is not like the battery, it is just a phospholipid bilayer with this pump that's chugging out sodiums and chugging in potassiums and using ATP energy to keep it moving, you can sometimes overshoot and hyperpolarize. We'll notice that when we're looking at the EKGs or ECGs of the heart. You've seen things that look like this. Here's your heartbeat. There's the depolarization. Here's the repolarization. And then, oops, there's the hyperpolarization. We went just a little too far, and then you come back up. So here's a picture that puts all of that stuff back together so we can see it all at one place. All right, so if you are resting, your muscle's not firing, your nerve's not firing, you have a charge across the membrane. We call it your resting membrane potential, and it's about minus 70 millivolts. Then you stimulate, and you stimulate, and you stimulate, and if you stimulate to the point where you hit the threshold, then you depolarize. So we go all the way up past zero millivolts to up to like 35 millivolts. And then you repolarize. And you put in the sodium and potassium back where they belong. You repolarize, repolarize, and you get down to the 70, the minus 70, and you kind of overshoot it a little bit, so you hyperpolarize, and then you get back to your resting membrane potential. So this is just any muscle, any nerve, and this is kind of what you would see that's going on. All of this activity is taking place right at the cell membrane, right at the phospholipid bilayer. So we're not talking about down inside the cytoplasm of the cell or way out in the extracellular fluid. We're literally talking right at the membrane. And one of the things that I want to point out is if you disrupt the sodium and the potassium, then your nerves aren't going to fire correctly and your muscles aren't going to fire correctly. And if you'll remember, your heart is a muscle, so your heart's not going to work correctly. And your brain is nerves or neurons and neuroglial cells, and it won't function correctly. So if you don't have the proper amount of sodium and potassium, it can kill you. So I want to tell a story about an aunt and an uncle that I had. They've passed now, so I can go ahead and, and uh, laugh at them since they're already gone. But my aunt loved her husband so much. And they had this whole big thing where they were going, oh, my God, sodium is evil. It's the devil. Oh, my goodness. Cut sodium out of everything. Sodium is awful. It'll cause your heart to stop. It'll cause, you know, and they just went on and on and on, as they do from time to time when they get on a kick about something. And she thought, well, I love my husband, and so I'm going to cut sodium out of his diet. And she was so successful at cutting sodium out of his diet. Anything that she normally would have put salt on, she put hot sauce on, which uh, she was such a good cook until she switched over to hot sauce because I don't care for hot sauce. But she was so successful that my uncle was out walking around in the yard and he just fell over. And there wasn't anything they could do to, to get him to move. They couldn't revive him. They couldn't do anything. So they called the ambulance, got him to the hospital, and they 
first thing they do is draw blood, and they send it off to the lab. And they said he doesn't have enough sodium in his body to cause his uh, nerves and muscles to work correctly. So they hooked him up to an IV, and they gave him sodium, and he came around, and he was okay. Luckily, he didn't die. But again, you need sodium in your diet, and you need potassium in your diet. You just don't need too much sodium in your diet, and you don't need too much potassium in your diet. In fact, uh, when you take a pet to have your pet euthanized, or if you have a criminal that you want to, to kill by lethal injection, you just give them potassium, and it kills them because their heart can't beat. So too much sodium, too much potassium, or not enough sodium, not enough potassium, are going to cause you some problems. So a lot of times people get a Charlie horse where they get a, a cramp in their gastrocnemius muscle, and it hurts like unbelievable. And I just say, well, do you drink a lot of um, caffeine? They go, well, yeah. I said, do you say, eat oranges or bananas or take potassium tablets or anything to replace all the potassium you're peeing out? Well, no. I said, well, you might want to try that if you're going to keep on drinking too much caffeine. So, back to our action potentials. These are kind of unusual because if you reach threshold, it's all or nothing. So either you get no reaction, you get no depolarization, but if you reach threshold, then it's the neuron will fire. And it will get the up to the maximum voltage it possibly can. And it's, it doesn't get weaker with distance. And it is irreversible. Once you start and fire, you start up at the axon hillock, right up at the cell body, the soma of the neuron, that depolarization event goes all the way down the axon, even if it's a three meter axon, it's going to go all the way to the end, and it's going to get to the axon terminal, and that's where we're going to talk about synapses. After you've fired a nerve, you enter the refractory period. So after that depolarization event happened and the action potential is going down the axon, you're, you enter a refractory period where you cannot get another action potential to start up. So it's just like you, once you have run your iPhone or your whatever thing that you have down, you can sit there and push the on-off button and push the on-off button and nothing's going to happen. You're going to have to recharge that thing before you can turn it back on and, and get it to do anything. So that's the refractory period or the period where your phone is dead. So no stimulus of any strength. So no matter how, I mean, you can try cussing and pushing on the button and it still won't cause your phone to come on. And you can sit there and send more chemicals, more light, more neurotransmitter, and, and you're still not going to get that axon to depolarize again because it's busy depolarizing already. So they talk about the refractory period. So here's what I just said in graph form. Here I can stimulate, 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 and then I hit the threshold, and then because of all or nothing, it is going to depolarize. And here it is depolarizing. And while I am depolarizing, there is no stimulus that will cause it to depolarize more. It's already doing as much as it can. And then it is repolarizing. So again, I still can't stimulate it and cause it to fire again. And then I'm going to hyperpolarize it, and I'm still in the refractory period, but if I give you enough stimulus here, I can get another action potential. So it's called a relative refractory period. This is absolute. Nothing's happening. Here, 
if you get enough stimulation, you can cause this to, to fire again. You do have some of your axons that are unmyelinated, and they will have voltage-gated channels all along the entire length of the axon. In the case of one that has myelin on it, then you're going to have the, the voltage-gated channels at those nodes of Ranvier. So you're going to get a jumping, a opening of voltage-gated channels and jump down, open the voltage-gated channels beyond the next Schwann cell, and so on. So this one, in a in a non-myelinated or unmyelinated axon has to open up voltage-gated channels all along the entire length. So this is going to be much slower than we would if we had a myelinated axon. But you still have voltage-gated channels. You still have the sodium rushing in, the potassium rushing out. So that part didn't change. You just have to go all the way down the length instead of jumping over the Schwann cells. And here's the artist's picture showing you what's going on. So here you have the sodium potassium at the nodes of Ranvier. And then you're going to have it at this point right here. So that's the jumping from node to node to node. And so it goes a lot faster because I don't have to depolarize the entire membrane, but only at the nodes. For our third and final installment of Chapter 12 and how nerves conduct, we're going to talk about synapses. So I will see you in Part 3 of Chapter 12.